Okay, so getting back to the story of Abraham. And remember, Abraham is commanded by God to put his son Isaac on the altar, to kill his son. Now, the discussion over the centuries is an ongoing debate, the philosophically minded. Uh, the erythropro dilemma, you might have heard of it, it goes, is, is it good because God is commanding it, or is God commanded because it's good? Well, we got a problem when we look at the story of Abraham. Because what God is commanding Abraham to do, is it good because God's commanding it? Well, no. <laughs> well, then it's good because God commands it. Well, no, not that either. So something else is going on, and the authors of the story are aware of the myth of the implications. The argument of the story, the implicit argument of the story, is that God's command, you are the person of faith. Abraham is the person of faith. And the Bible backs this up thousands of times. It says, you know, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. God says, kill your son. Abraham doesn't wrestle. He doesn't go, well, is that good, bad, right, wrong? God says, do it. You do it. Period. That is the beginning and the end of the discussion. Well, we didn't have a discussion. You, there's nothing to discuss. God said, do it. You do it. Period. The only thing to ascertain, do you have a relationship with God? Yes. Was that God who said to do it? Yes. Did he actually say it? Yes. Then you do it. Period. End of the discussion. The hidden, the hidden meaning is that the command of God transcends all notions of good or bad. That's the thing that people are missing with the, with the philosophers miss. They try and bring, it, bring God's command down into the realm of normal ethics. And the, the, the message in the Bible is pretty crystal clear. It isn't normal ethics. God's command transcends the notion of right or wrong, good or bad. So you do it, period. Now, the only person, the only philosopher I know of who, who reads this story correctly and, and tries to process it the right way is Kierkegaard. And he understands the value of this story and he wrestles with it a lot in the book Fear and Trembling. The knight of faith, the person of faith, does not decide for himself one way or the other, good, bad, right or wrong. He just does what God tells him to do. And actually, this is backed up by the Bible. The Gospel says, those who, who, who try to hold on to their life will lose it. If you give up your life for my sake, you will find it. Now, Kierkegaard was getting at something. That this, this is actually the path, the right path to transcending reality itself. To overcoming the real world itself. To walking on the water. The Christianity agrees with this. It's said a hundred times that Abraham is the right model. And Abraham does not wrestle with, with the morality of what God commands him to do. It, if he did, he wouldn't do it. Because it is clearly wrong. And it's supposed to be clearly wrong to you, the reader. That's what the atheists and the people arguing with the Bible don't seem to recognize. Is that the people writing the story understood that it is cray-cray to, to say, kill your son. It isn't, it's not a, it's not a you know... It's not a, his, uh, a mystery there. It's exactly what it appears to be on the surface. It's not kill your son, you know, because that's a, that's a reasonable thing to ask of you. It's do it. Period. I said it. Do it. Now. Now, the Christian interpretation of that is you, you take away your own self. You deny yourself. You don't decide one way or the other, good, bad, right, or wrong. Now, I don't want to go into the hidden... You know, the obvious, we, the, I, the Christian, trust God so much. You know, I, I I've, have enough understanding of the goodness of God, yada, 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 boring, boring, boring. Because that's not really the point. That's not where Kierkegaard went with it. That's not where the authors are going with the story. And that's not really the hidden message of the story. Oh, God is so good and I love him so much and blah, blah, blah. He's never going to ask me to do something wrong. He clearly asked you to do something wrong. You do it anyways. You do it anyways. You give yourself 150% to the God project. 
That is the night of faith. You completely and utterly surrender your own desires and you surrender your own will and you surrender once and for all your own interpretation of whether that is good or bad, right or wrong. You don't decide, you just do. Now Kierkegaard recognized that as the path, as the correct path. Now we have a different interpretation of Christianity by let's say Nietzsche. And I'm gonna bounce between these two a lot because they're my two favorite philosophers, but they both argue some of the same stuff. Nietzsche recognized that Christianity was asking you to give up yourself, to, to it was a path of self-abnegation. He criticized it for that. He said, it's a path of surrendering all that is good in this world, you know, and surrendering who you truly are. Now, Christianity agrees with him, but he didn't recognize the end product. Kierkegaard sees the end product, an inherent, in the story and inherent in the Christian message is the end product. We aren't denying ourselves for no good reason. We are denying ourselves and we are, we are giving up our own desires and we are giving up, we are, we are on a path of, you know, shutting out the world and surrendering to God further and further and getting lower and lower and smaller and smaller. Nietzsche was right. But we're doing it for a reason. And the promise is, at the end of that, comes greatness. Kierkegaard saw that. That is a path to greatness. The promise of God is that you will then be able to do works. What kind of works? Greater works than Jesus. That's what the Bible says. What does that mean? It means we're going to do better things than God. Greater works than God. Nietzsche saw it only as a path of self-abnegation. So he spoke a different path in the Superman. But the reason why ultimately it led to insanity is very metaphorical that he went crazy at the end of his life because his version of overcoming humanity, which is what he was trying to do, transcend humanity, is the Superman. Becomes so, you know, overabundantly human within the human, and it can't be done. That's the paradox. The paradox is found in Christianity. The more you give up the world, the more you give up the power and the seduction of this world, the more you surrender yourself, the more you make yourself smaller, weaker, you know, you become a little, little piece of dust on God's toenail doing whatever he tells you to do. Give up all thoughts of your own desires. More and more and more because this is hard to do. Jesus could do it. The rest of us struggle with this. Give up who you are. That is what the Bible is telling you to do. But it's telling you you're going to find something at the, at the end of that. It's telling you that is the path to true greatness. You're going to find glory at the end of that. You're going to find yourself being glorified at the end of that. Now Nietzsche uh, uh, saw the opposite. He didn't see the end product. He just saw it as a path of denying everything that this world is about denying yourself. He saw the denial. And he said, that's weakness, that's sickness, that's, that's, he, he saw it as a type of evil. It's sickness. And if you don't see the end, it's, it, you can argue it that way, sure. But the promise of God is that you're going to find yourself by doing that. That's the paradox of the whole thing. The less you concern yourself for even the ethics, okay, when we talk, when we go back to the garden, I'll go over this a hundred times, when we go back to the garden, people again, people get this all wrong. First of all, is it literally true? Doesn't matter, who cares? It's, it's the theological template that is important and the spiritual message. Doesn't matter if Adam and Eve were an actual human beings. They can be theological constructs. And it's, the argument is 